Welcome everyone to EA Zoom Meetings Astrological Overview for 2020. I'm your host, Linda Johnson. Today we are proud to present 24 of the world's most outstanding evolutionary astrologers, each of whom will present a 15 minute topic on the transits and energies of 2020. Certified in the Jeffrey Wolf Green School of Evolutionary Astrology, these accomplished astrologers now continue in this great EA work. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Let's begin. Hello, everyone. This is a song written by the great Nako Bear that I believe reflects the energies most prevalent here in 2020. <laughs> Great Spirit, I have had it, bring me back to the nomadic way of weaving through the damage, mindful, stay mindful. Great Spirit, for my sisters, let me be a flowing river. Flood the banks, the rocks that bind her, carry, I'll carry great, great spirit, oh, great, great spirit, great spirit. For my brothers, let me be a mountain under which he climbs to discover his process. Now that's progress. Great spirit, all that hinders, tie reminders to my fingers. I must speak with you more often. Mm -hmm. Great, great spirit, oh, great, great spirit, great spirit for my relations, give them strength to face racism in every single situation. Easy now, go on, speak loud. Great spirit, take me instead. Guide me down the road of red and kashala. I am saying and I'm praying great. Great Spirit, Tunkashala, ah, Tunkashala, ah, Great Spirit, the stone collapse, nothing but the earth will last and I'll be singing sweetly to the darkness. Now hark this great spirit on my tongue. Be still, be still. The time will come when everyone will sing our life is sacred. But while I'm waiting, great spirit, my fist is up. Bringing the power to the people, your reflections of us. Some of the people can't hear it, the cries of the earth. Some of the people can't feel it, the way that it hurts, and it hurts, great spirit. And it moves, great spirit. 
Interconnected in a wreckage of a paradigm on its way out, its way out. Speaking of spiritual lyrical testimony, spirit that did resist weaving around false prophecies, spirit directed and selected with the message I bring. While the ship slowly sinks, I've been directed to sing like a wrecking ball, breaking down the walls of the past. Minimalist, living on this with the last of my cash. You're gonna be justified by how you treated the land. You're gonna be by my side when I stand in the man to hey, 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 change. In our astrological overview for 2020 with our first speaker, Kristen Fontana from kristenfontana.com. Her topic is Saturn in Aquarius. Kristen had a life altering experience when she met her greatest life teacher, Jeffrey Wolf Green. Kristen is a teacher, author, lecturer, radio host and educator with the Jeffrey Wolf Green School of Evolutionary Astrology. Welcome Kristen. Please unmute and begin your presentation. Thank you, Linda. Upon entering 2020, we approach a historic astrological alignment, a rare Capricorn stellium that is already in motion and increasing in intensity. Saturn and Capricorn will form a new phase conjunction to Pluto on January 12th, 2020, symbolizing a new chapter in your soul's evolution. The question now is, what in your life has run its course? What no longer supports your soul? Where is the rub and the source of irritation? If you live in California long enough, <laughs> you know an earthquake is coming eventually due to living near the fault lines. The same feeling is true now for all of us on the planet. An earthquake of sorts is coming because it's time. Saturn will progress on through Capricorn and enter the sign of Aquarius on March 22, 2020. However, Saturn will only be in Aquarius for a little over three months before re-entering Capricorn in cardinal fashion on July 1st. Saturn will then again not re-enter Aquarius until December of 2020, giving you a little over three months to get a taste of this coming Aquarian influence. With Saturn and Aquarius on the horizon, it carries an energy of anticipation. Similar to how an animal can feel that earthquake long before it strikes, something is destined to change in your life. In some cases, radically so. Over 30 years ago, the founder of EA, Jeff Green, wrote a book called Uranus, Freedom from the Known. That was in 1988 when it was released. I will share an excerpt here to see if any of this foretelling resonates for what we are all experiencing now. He writes, as we move ever closer to the famed Aquarian age, new and different social structures and laws will necessarily evolve. The danger of the area of the era that we all currently share lies in extremism and in sectarian moral and religious philosophies that attempt to control dominate or suppress ideas or views that are different from the extremist agenda. The Iranian liberation of our times, collectively speaking, will involve the enlightened awareness that reflects the principle of unity and diversity, not unity and sameness. As the age of Pisces mutates into the age of Aquarius, an opportunity exists to break free and liberate from history repeating itself. The human species is on the verge, once again, of radically altering its existence. We are all in the midst of another and accelerated technological and scientific revolution that will ultimately impact on every aspect of individual and collective life. You can see here the chart for Saturn entering the sign of Aquarius. 
in March of 2020. And as we all know, when we're moving around the zodiac from Capricorn to Aquarius, the energy is dramatically different. The energy of Saturn or Capricorn carries a more serious, limiting, dogmatic, repressive, in some cases, energy. We're all experiencing this extreme now, uh, culturally, culturally, politically, collectively, and it does feel very much like history repeating itself. With Saturn moving into the sign of Aquarius, it's going to be like a jackhammer to cement, as Jeffrey used to say. Old models will not be able to sustain themselves. There will be a revolution of sorts, and we're all a part of it. We are all experiencing history in the making, and we are in a transition. With Saturn and Aquarius, it's really preparing us for when Pluto moves into Aquarius in a few years down the line here. So for all of you listening and tuning into your own lives and the nature of your soul and what it is that you're doing on this planet at this time, you are going to be feeling an anticipation of change. You're going to be thinking a great deal about what is it that I need to change in my life in order to support what I feel my soul has come here to do. I've spoken in other webinars about the nature of the fingerprint that we all have. Just like the soul, no two fingerprints are alike. And most people will deviate from that fingerprint, that individual mark that we all have in order to survive, <laughs> in order to uh, protect ourselves. It takes a lot of courage to honor and own, embrace and accept our natural design if, it's, if it goes against consensus models because of the fear of judgment, because of other people not understanding us, being able to align with us. So it does take courage to stand on your own if necessary, which is very much a Aquarian phenomena. It also will involve people aligning with others of like mind, joining forces with others with the same belief system or the same uh, ideas and understanding. I love what Ryan was singing about, returning to the nomadic life. That's such a Sagittarian word and a natural word, nomadic, natural, organic, authentic. And your Aquarius energy will allow us to break down old structures so our natural magnetism, our natural energy can emerge. So our signal that we send out to the world can be received without static. Okay, so can I see the next slide? Now, this visual is a little off. I'm seeing this from other people in the chat, and it's not super clear, but I'm going to do my best with this. What you see here is an image of the root chakra. And the root chakra is an energy center at the base of your spine. We do have seven chakras. Uh, the first chakra being at the root and the base of your spine and we've got three layers of the root chakra. Every chakra is ruled by a specific planet. In this case, we've got Pluto at the center of the root chakra, which is your soul. Overlapped with that layer is ruled by Uranus, which is a ruler for Aquarius. Uranus is your vibration, the soul's vibration what you emanate to the world, the signal that you send out, like a song. The outer ring is ruled by Saturn, which is the, the, uh, the layer that protects you, that allows you to defend against other things that you fear or feel may cause you harm. It's a way of protecting your soul and your center. And depending on how much any soul is repressing or resisting will dictate how thick that outer ring becomes. If somebody's out in the world in a very Aquarian way and they're resisting nothing, 
that outer ring is going to be very thin. If you are repressing a lot, resisting, and you are falling prey to the conditioning or your upbringing, that outer ring is going to be very thick. The goal here is to eliminate the layers of holding, the resistance, to slip out of old clothing, so to speak, so more of your essence can be emitted. And Saturn in Aquarius, Saturn being that outer ring, being transmuted into an Aquarian vibration is going to allow more of that, whatever has become crystallized, to fall away. Whatever has been conditioned to be removed. Because at the end you know, of this journey, nothing is going to be more important than whether you honored what it was that your soul came here to do. Did you give? Did you share? Did you include? Or did you separate and exclude? Did you follow the norms? Did you follow consensus? So with this transit of Saturn into Aquarius, it will allow you to honor, to actualize your individuality in the world. Joining forces with who you inherently are. Joining forces with your soul, aligning with others that are doing the same, and coming to remember again who you are and how you were created, and celebrating that. This is such a, a Uranian image here. <laughs> it's uh, all over the place. Hopefully you can see it clearly. Here we go. That middle layer is Uranus in nature. So the electricity that you're seeing coming out of that core of Pluto can be felt in the world as well, whether it's through storms or earthquakes, maybe there are sudden events that are occurring in your own life as well. So I'm waiting for this slide to come back. Here we go. So the goal for all of us is to ask yourself, we can go to the next slide if you would. What is the one thing you would change in your life if you could in order to set yourself free? Saturn and Capricorn can be that experience of being held back or even just totally limited by something whether it's a relationship you need to leave or a job that does not reflect your natural way in the world. There's an opportunity for you to totally liberate yourself and to experience a freedom from the known. There's more information about Uranus as we experience it in the world and in our lives uh, in the book that I shared an excerpt from earlier by Jeff Green. And in the next image, you'll see this here, uh, Uranus, freedom from the known. So as we're all preparing for this very uh, significant shift of Saturn, uh, the structural nature of consciousness and how we experience the world, the container, in essence, shifting into Aquarius will be a radical change for all of us. So you can get a hold of this book and learn more about it if you don't already have it. And I wish you all a beautiful and liberating new year in 2020. Namaste. Our next speaker is Simon Vorster from RaisingVibrations.com. His topic is the Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto stellium. Simon is an evolutionary astrologer, author, and teacher, basing his work on the original teachings of Jeffrey Wolf Green. His role brings about a unique perspective in seeing a soul's journey across time. He offers training programs in EA. Welcome, Simon. Please begin. Um, what, in, what a year we're going to be experiencing uh, in 2020 and Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, Stellium, whenever those planets have a conversation with each other, we know that within our personal lives and for the collective, things are going to change. Um, think about uh, the 2000s. Think about the nature of what we were experiencing and feeling collectively. 
um, when uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn made their conjunction in Taurus. Um, we can think about 1981 and when that conjunction was taking place in, in Libra. And we can think about um, the relationship that Pluto and Saturn were also having in 1981, 1982, 1983. There was a lot of uh, change that was taking place. And, and of course, we know Pluto reflects um, the deepest unconscious material that we as a human race have that we're coming out of work through. And of course, um, individually for us, whatever that means, right? Um, so I, I feel like there are so many ways to take, to look at this stellium and to bring light and shed light to it. So I've gone ahead and I've um, specifically chosen three themes that I feel would be relevant um, to the conversation that I feel could support uh, anybody that's watching this, this video afterwards. Themes that I would say, um, you know, mean something to me. Like wh why does it mean something to me? And uh, uh, here's the astrology chart. So thanks very much, Linda, for posting that. And um, I just briefly, this is, this is just uh, uh, January 2000, uh, January the 12th, 2020. And um, this is just sort of looking at the trans, the, the shape of, of the year. It's, of course, there's going to be lots going on. But things, things to note are Jupiter trining Uranus and the South Node. So I think this Jupiter in Capricorn trining this, uh, Uranus is a big deal because that vibration um, carries with going as when Jupiter and Saturn make the conjunction and when Jupiter uh, hits Pluto as well. So the, the Jupiter in Capricorn is going to contain a lot of Uranian impulses for of us. So right now, um, whatever it is that we're dealing with in terms of insights, accelerated um, thinking patterns, I've had a tremendous amount of already, uh, you know, just Uranian moments where my own philosophy and core truth is kind of opening up like this. Um, I think there's a lot of significance uh, considering that Jupiter has just come out of Sag. So there's definitely some uh, acceleration and, and fragmentation around our core philosophies and truths that we're experiencing and if we're sensitive to them. And I think that trine is really supporting the ability for us to integrate it into our daily activities or at least integrate it into our um, uh, choices so that that leads to progressive change within our lives, kind of an embodiment process. So, and, and then of course the South Node speaks to me a lot because um, you can see Jupiter making the square to Chiron and the South Node making a square to Chiron. Just, um, you know, this is all occurring at the same time that we're preparing for a nodal shift that will take place. And also, also at the same time when um, we're going to have a solar eclipse in Capricorn. And what I find really interesting about the square is that uh, since 2012, we've been experiencing Pluto-Uranus square and what I've noticed in the collective has been that a lot of materials come to the surface around where there's a tremendous amount of repression due to the Capricorn ecosystem and structure that we've had for a long time. And everybody's finding their individuality in some way and in some sense. And Chiron's transit through Aries is now bringing to us the actual emotional integration of where it can be sustainable, like where minority groups and uh, different identity groups that have voices coming into the surface can be able to express their individuality in different ways and new ways. And what that means for the social landscape of our uh, humanity, you know, I'm just talking a little bit about, you know, what uh, Kristen was referring to in terms of the Iranian field and breaking out, you know, we're, we're living in a time where technology and, um, the ability to be connected and interconnected in this way is so uh, clear and transparent and, and profound that this is very new territory for us. And I feel like there's, there's a lot for us to discover right now as the stellium kind of forms into an entire 20 year cycle of what it means for us to develop new laws, Jupiter, how we're going to govern and put to those laws and implement them, Saturn, and how Pluto in its final sort of uh, ascent through the, the end stages of Capricorn are actually going to crystallize this new sense of self-identity that we as a human race are able to um, see ourselves as and how we individually see ourselves as well. 
And then something also that fascinates me about this is that, uh, you know, we've had the South Node transiting through Capricorn and the planetary ruler of that is Saturn. And when the South Node moves into Sagittarius, it's going to have the planetary ruler being Jupiter. So effectively, we've got almost, you know, three and a half or four years worth of planetary rulers, i.e. the South Nodes being influenced deeply by this Capricornian structure. Um, so we've got Saturn reconstructing and, and laying down the scaffolding for how we want to be real and authentic in our lives. And Jupiter is now coming along in my eyes and providing us with the moral structure in which we're going to define things. Like, for instance, is this good? Is this bad? Does that equal something that is healthy for our existence? Do we need to cut that out? And so on and so forth. And I think that ties in deeply with how we're going to integrate the Pluto Uranus square with Chiron transiting through Aries. And then of course, Jupiter and Pluto will actually make a conjunction three times in the year. This one, um, it's going to happen in April, June, and November. So let's just a kind of uh, look at the astrology and the aspects. So if Linda, you can switch to the next. If you could switch one more uh, where it's shadow work, if that's possible. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So I feel that this, uh, uh, the, the shadow work uh, slide. So if you can uh, put that on for us, Linda, I think you had it over there. That one's the last one, by the way, I have three. Oops. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I feel that, uh, anybody that's watching this, that, that is not familiar with this, or if you are familiar with it, I encourage you to spend a great deal of time in 2020, really, really getting deep into your own personal shadow work and to, to understand this, this uh, dynamic really, really clearly. Why? Because number one, we are at a, at a very critical point in our lives as a human race in which our capacity to really structure and restructure and renegotiate what we consider to be healthy psychological and emotional um, behavior patterns that will not only become the, the foundation for our generations to come and our children, but also in terms of the fact that what are the types of laws and regulations that we feel are going to become important to us because there's a lot of influence that's taking place with technological companies like YouTube, for instance, and Facebook that have, that, you know, design algorithms. We never had this before. So what this means is that platforms like YouTube and Facebook, et cetera, are just feeding grounds for a psychological projection. And we, segregate and divide ourselves because we're not actually seeing our own shadow in this sense. And I feel that this is a critical aspect of healing, not only your own psyche and being more sort of valuable to your own life and to other people's lives, but to be able to understand the content of why this is so um, crucial again, is this integration and realizing Capricorn as an archetype. And we are moving out of a very intensely, um, uh, repressive period of existence. And of course there are a tremendous amount of disowned aspects of ourselves through society saying that that's not good. That's not good. That's not good. And we've kind of disowned that part, and we, we tend to then hold that projection and hang that up on other people. And, and that's, we don't even honor that. We don't even see that. We don't even own that. So Capricorn has a lot to do with owning stuff. Uh, and I don't mean physical and material, I mean owning your own psychological and emotional um, uh, leakages in that sense. Um, we, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, they've all gone over their own south nodes, not to get too technical, planetary south nodes. So we have a tremendous amount of collective memory coming up to the surface that we're all kind of integrate, like being reflective of, and this is religion. You know, we're still coming out of healing that separation and that division, social division, the left versus the right, meat people versus vegan and anything that can literally divide people, Uranus and Aries and Chiron and Aries that, that, have, that are now transiting and has transited through. We have a lot of separation, a lot of different types of communities that are forming and our capacity to actually be able to understand one another is becoming incredibly brittle because of our inability to have tolerance and things like this. And so really coming to understand our shadow work is an essential part of not only healing our ancestral memory, 
but also the capacity to move forward in a way that, you know, is, is holistic and integrated. And of course, this comes to healing your other mother complex, your other father wound. All of these things are really, really important, I feel, with, um, with these transits. And of course, Capricorn speaks to all of these essential maturation processes, i.e. the realization of how the psyche structures its maturation process, going from our shadow to the most integrated parts of ourselves. Um, okay, next one, please. Uh, Linda, if you can go to the one that is called social reform. I'm going to speak a little bit fast over here because I fear that uh, there might be some time running out. Yes, fantastic. So just a couple of dates that I wanted to put across over here. Um, uh, there, 19, November 1982, if I'm not mistaken, let me just do that over there. Pluto, Saturn, conjunction in Libra. Um, this is an entirely new paradigm. So just kind of really, really deeply speaking to the essence of what is the energy shaping and holding what types of archetypes are coming into our collective consciousness that will become the, the vehicle for what shapes our psychological and emotional perceptions of ourselves. And so this is another cycle that will speak to a lot of social reform. A lot of, as I said before, when these social reforms took place, technology wasn't available in the way that it is today. And I think that we are in really, really interesting times in which the nature of technology under a social reform can reveal to us not only this kind of Promethean thing of we have been given fire to illuminate and to really provide us with accelerated understanding of medical things, et cetera, but it also can be used for incredibly dark agendas. And so this comes back to this idea of really speaking to, to healing the shadow and understanding that we're at a very critical time in reforming the way that we actually interact with each other and how we can actually create a tremendous amount of distance because we're unable to actually communicate with each other anymore because on one level social media really brings this this kind of ugliness to the surface so there's a tremendous amount of of real work that seems to be um, prevalent with all of this capricorn stuff so as i said what does it mean to live in a world that is so open and yet is so divided you know, that how, how, much, how much we can get triggered easily by fake news, things like Donald Trump, for instance, uh, war in, in, in other parts of the world, you know, just, you can just like name those things. And how do we interact with that? How do we stay sane is a really important uh, concept here. So tolerance, things like being able to, to be curious about what it is that the other person may be feeling upset about and, you know, kind of getting really, aware of the fact that we're all in this storm together in some way, shape or form. We're all on different islands going, Jesus, if you saw it from my perspective over here, you would see that the reason why I'm acting this way is like that and so on and so forth. And there needs to be a really sort of deep growing up regarding the nature of how we actually understand what it means to be activists in this sense, you know, not just contributing to a very rebellious Iranian impulse. Um, and finally, uh, Linda, if you can uh, pass me to the breathe or the, the breath, this the last slide, that'd be great. Fantastic. Thank you. So ultimately, the archetype of Capricorn really speaks to the ability to become incredibly centered within oneself, to become very solid, you know, in, in a man, this is the, the maturation process of his psyche is to come into his kingness, to be able to understand his centeredness, to be able to see his land in that way and to really rule with integrity. And I, Capricorn really speaks to the ability to mature into this, this space within our side. And the female, for instance, is stepping into her queendom, being able to really understand her presence, her, her feminine nature, and to be able to integrate all of these principles that are healthy. And Capricorn is that process of, as I said, coming into uh, that structure. Breathing and breath work or being able to breathe through these intense moments of um, emotional upheaval that takes place is an incredibly vital um, process when it comes to being able to not only balance the nervous system, but being able to actually stay in a state in which we are open and we are able to actually create conversations that are lengthy in which we're able to digest reality and process it as we go through this incredible shift 
because we are moving through incredibly profound times in which the necessity for communication and dialogue is essential between us. Um, I feel that there's a kind of leap in evolution and we're a part of a, a part of the past of this evolution. And there's a lot of new things coming into our field that we don't know. And the ability to be able to actually communicate and, and experience life in a, in a very conscious way is the capacity to understand the breath. And so I encourage you every single day to begin a practice of some form of breathing, some form of breath work, Capricorn. Capricorn is the skin. So we're dealing with this process of really breathing into life, breathing into anxiety, breathing into your feelings of, of sadness or guilt, guilt or grief or you know, all of these types of things, really owning those emotions and then coming back into the cipher and just kind of grounding them into yourself and really, really practicing this process so that you can remain very centered within your place with very stillness and, and clarity and really understanding the breath is vitality. Without that, it's not possible for us to experience all these other things. And so being in the moment is a very Capricorn thing. So we experience each moment as it moves through. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my feelings and thoughts over here. I really appreciate it, Linda and everybody else, uh, and have an amazing uh, Christmas and holidays. Thank you. Her topic is Mars retrograde. Tara is an evolutionary astrologer working with the archetypes experientially. She's passionate about the technique Planets on the First, as a writer and teacher, Tara works with a broad range of meta metaphysics, from astrology and the tarot to crystals, animal medicine, and the hermetic principles. She is committed to supporting herself and others to be more honest, aware, real, and compassionate. Welcome, Tara. Please begin. Oh, there we go. Hello, everyone. Before we jump in, I please receive my gratitude to, to all of you in the EA Zoom community, Linda and the admins and the speakers and the volunteers and the viewers, everybody. It really is such a blessing to be part of this. And I've been doing it for, I guess, a number of years now, maybe almost since the beginning. And it still continues to be one of the, really one of the most joyful ways that I experience astrology. So huge, huge thank you. So with that, let's just jump in. So Mars retrograde, it's funny, after all that Neptune talk, I was like, ooh, Mars gets itchy, you know, just kind of wants to move on forward. But our Mars retrograde is going to happen September 9th of 2020 until November 13th. And so when I think about Mars retrograde, before we even look at some of the aspects it's going to make, uh, it's just one of, like, to really get familiar with Mars. So as a function in us, what is Mars? What is that Martian thing? And um, without spending too much time, some of the pieces that always hit home for me are, you know, Mars and a big effect is our energy. Um, it's what gets us going, our get up and go. It's what excites us, our authentic desire, initiation, and it's the desire to really separate and do our own thing. The glyph of Mars is the circle with the arrow pointing out, which is breaking out of the collective, right? So there's a natural um, instinct in Mars to get away from the crowd or to get away from mom and dad or to get away from conditioning and to do it my way. And, and so especially with this Mars retrograde in this sign of Aries, it's a its own sign, uh, those qualities are just going to be magnified. So, and some of these things, as far as asking ourselves, and as I was asking myself this morning, sort of what are, when I check in with myself around Mars retrograde, um, part of this is, what have we been going for? You know, or ask yourself, what have you been going for, right? Mars, Mars is a, get after it and get it. And even if your Mars isn't particularly like, fiery in nature, it still desires to go after and achieve something, uh, and it wants a purpose. So thinking about what you've been going for uh, is important because during the retrograde, we're being asked to really reconsider what we've been going for and what we've been putting our energy into. So one thing that can happen in Mars retrograde is we can feel tired, especially if we've been putting our energy into things that aren't really... Uh, are really worth it, that, that we don't really value or that are like empty once we get there. So burnout can happen with Mars retrograde. 
Do you know some of the questions? Are you pursuing the things that are most meaningful? Are you going after the things most, most meaningful? Are you fighting for the things that are most meaningful? Um, and this doesn't have to be a, you know, a rough, tough Mars kind of thing. It can be you know, going for peace or finding that equilibrium that you need or cooperation. But, but um, some of us have been putting a lot of energy into certain projects and sometimes running ourselves ragged. So Mars retrograde is a good time to stop and say, okay, is this really where I want to be going? And some things to keep in mind with Mars. Mars does want to win. It wants something it can win at. And it truly wants honor. So uh, even though Mars has a good fight in it, you know, it's a fair fight. Mars faces it's face to face when you fight. There's not, you know, something coming around the back. There's not a manipulation. It really is. Let's get in the ring face to face and let's fight this out. Uh, that's one of the positive qualities to Mars. Um, but this whole idea of what we fight for and what we need to fight for and what that means, sometimes it's something to be thinking about during a Mars retrograde because many of us fight ourselves in certain ways. So it's a good time to sit and think, am I fighting against or for things that don't make sense for me? And another thing to think about is, have you been starting things and pushing things that are not a good use of your energy um, and that are not a good, um, they don't serve the greater good. They don't serve you at a greater level and they don't serve the people around you or even community um, it can go as far as the universe or cosmos or everything if you want, because part of this, and I'm going to switch over to the aspects real quick, is that it's getting ourselves in alignment personally with the greater picture. It's a big part of what this Mars retrograde is. So Mars, when it goes retrograde, it'll be 28 degrees, nine minutes Aries. And I'm going to read the Sabian symbol for that, but I'm going to wait just a few minutes here. So at that point in time, there'll be a loose square to Saturn and Pluto, and then I'm linking Jupiter in because they're all kind of hanging out there together. It's going to be a loose square, right? And squares always are some sort of a tension, right? There's some sort of a struggle between things. So it starts out with that, that loose tension, but then during the retrograde, Mars is going to have exact squares to each of those planets. And so on se se September 29th, there's going to be an exact Mars Saturn square. So take this energy of Mars and especially Mars in Aries. I want to do my own thing. I want to do it my way. I want to keep moving forward. Um, I don't really want other people in my way. You know, Mars is not about overthinking it, right? Mars is really about doing it and having the space to do it the way you want to do it. So, when we bump up with Saturn and Capricorn, we bump into conditioning. We bumped into expectations and all of a sudden time and tradition and things like endurance and patience and responsibility. And so that Mars, you can sometimes, you, if you like, sometimes for me, I think about Mars in its essence as either a two-year-old or a teenager. It's those ages and areas in our lives where we're really trying to kind of break free and have our independence. Some of us that happens later in life if we didn't do it fully younger. And that can happen in all points in time when we realize, whoa, you know, I don't want to do it this way anymore. I've got my own trail to blaze. But that square with Saturn is going to say, nope, there's, you, you've, gonna, you've got to look at these things like patience, endurance, and progress, and long term. Where are you going long term with it? So that challenge is going to happen. And then on October 9th, they will be an exact square with Pluto, which is interesting because Mars in some respects is our lower W willpower, more connected with the ego sense. Um, and Pluto being the capital W willpower connected with you know, the deeper will of the soul. So now you've got in some respects a challenge between what I think my personal desires are and by the way, with Mars, it's easy to get seduced. You know, it's easy to get um, excited and, and um, seeing the bright, shiny, exciting thing that feels like it's going to really turn me on. And it may not be authentic, right? So there's that to keep in mind, too. But when it squares off with Pluto, all of a sudden, now we're dealing with change and evolution that we don't control, right? So here's Mars. I want to go in my straight line trajectory onto what I want to get. I want to stand up for myself. I want to make it happen for me and I want to do it my way. 
And now all of a sudden there's like this kind of heavy weight of evolution that hangs over us. And Pluto um, also has a lot to do with um, psychological analysis. So there will be a tendency to like to dig deep on like, what are the deeper motives around what I've been going for? What are the, what are some of the, the deeper, maybe Mars issues that I need to really dig deep into uh, and pull out to the surface so I can look at, but Mars as an archetype doesn't need therapy, right? That is not, um, Mars is not going to be the, it's going to just keep on going. I don't need therapy. I'm fine. Moving on forward. And so this is going to be, no, maybe we do need to look deeper. Maybe we do need to get under the surface. Maybe you can't just continue pushing your energy hard in a direct line without consequences. And so much of this to me is getting in alignment with the soul's deeper desire, right? The soul's uh, deeper intention, which is evolutionary astrology. I mean, we all know that that is, that the Pluto for us is the deepest desire of the soul. Uh, okay. Then finally it comes to the Jupiter square that happens on October 18th. And I was thinking about this one because, you know, I think Mars and Jupiter play uh, a little more naturally together than Saturn or Pluto uh, may in this respect, at least. Uh, but they're all, all of those, um, you know, those, uh, those planets, Saturn, Pluto, and Jupiter are all in Capricorn and Capricorn and Aries, you know, there's always going to be this dynamic between doing it my way and having to somehow fit into the greater structure and having to look at what's happened in the past and maybe having to put up with some conditioning in order to truly reach uh, where you want to go. And part of this is awesome because you don't need to rework everything, right? That, that desire to go do it on your own, a lot of it's already been done. And, you know, we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors um, and, and, and we know as astrologers, especially like there's a lot of work and things that have been done, been done before us and we don't need to rework it. In fact, that's not even a great use of our energy. It would be better if we could take what's been done and move forward with it. And that takes some um, tempering, but back to the Jupiter place or the Jupiter square. So Jupiter, especially in Capricorn wants us to look at the bigger truth that includes all of us. And Mars can get so um, focused on the me path. And so Jupiter is need to see that bigger and need to see how it serves something greater need um, to look at the truth in a realistic way, right? Truth is a very Jupiter thing, but with Capricorn, there's a realistic nature to it. Um, and this idea of expansion, but expansion in a way that doesn't just serve me, but serves something greater. And by the way, serving something greater does serve me. They go hand in hand, but it's all about perspective here. So uh, the, the, the ego self, uh, in some respects, with this with this Mars energy, we're getting a relook at it. Like, how do we actually work with that smaller S self, with the greater S self, and then with the greater unity of all of us? So this idea of Jupiter, you know, is kind of as, hey, how are you going to contribute to society? How are you going to bring more meaning to what it is that you're doing personally, and how can you share that meaning? And then, of course, we all know that since this is during retrograde, that when Mars goes direct, it's going to hit all of these again. So we have some time here to play with this energy. We have some real time to try to get aligned, our individual uh, agendas aligned with something greater. I want to read the Sabian symbol for when Mars first goes direct is, is a 28 degrees, 9 minutes. Aries, which means it's a 29 degree Sabian symbol. I'm reading from Dane Rujar as an astrological mandala. And Aries 29 degrees, the music of the spheres, attunement to cosmic order. At the fourth stage of a five-fold sequence, a technique is often presented. It is based on the experiences implied in the preceding symbols. In this case, what the individual who has entered into a new realm of possibilities of action should learn is the harmonic principles operating in this realm. The music of the spheres is the celestial embodiment of principles of polyphonic interplay. The individual advancing on the path should seek to understand and realize his place in the vast scheme of mankind's evolution, in the immense chord of the harmony of the universe. The message to the seeker for meaning which is implied in this symbol is to listen to the inner voice, to listen without personalizing this voice in a glamour producing manner. It is the voice of the whole, 
of which one begins to realize that one is a tiny little part, yet a significant part, for every note of the universal chord has its place and its ineradicable meaning. And how perfect is that for Mars literally having interplay, integrating with these set with these planets in Capricorn, with these all these big hitters. It is about exactly doing that. And I thought that was very, very beautiful. Okay. Let me see. So one thing to keep in mind also with Mars retrograde is that Mars is the pusher and the runner. And Mars uh, typically doesn't like to be pushed or stopped. So in Mars retrograde, it can oftentimes feel like we're being pushed or stopped or held back. And there's not necessarily something we need to do about that. Sometimes we just need to feel our way through that. But why might it be that we suddenly reach this point of feeling like we're being stopped or pushed or held back? And I believe it's because we need to slow down enough to feel this part of us. It's actually us resisting. It's us trying to reevaluate and realign. And when we really feel into that, like we will get those messages in our body. It's Mars retrograde in Aries, raw energy, raw life force. And you don't have to overthink it or even work too hard to figure it out. If you spend time with it, it will come to you. And if you have felt to some extent like you have a hard time sort of initiating yourself and stepping into your own power, you know, this is a good time to look at that. You know, have you been standing up for yourself? And if there are things you really have been wanting and you know in your heart you really, really want them, Mars retrograde is a good time to really reevaluate how you can go about starting to make those things happen for yourself. Because Mars isn't just about the desire. It's about doing what it takes to achieve that thing. You know, it's going after what you want. So my very last thoughts here is for me, I was thinking about, this is kind of like an affirmation, I suppose, but it's what came to me when I was sitting in this space. Because thinking on how Mars is hard to stop, especially Mars and Aries, and thinking about this whole little lineup of activity. I am made for more and I will restore and realign my energy to and for that purpose. If I don't know what that is yet, I will wait and listen. The only fight I ever have is with myself. I will face that. So, happy almost 2020 to everyone. Thank you for being here whenever it is that you tune in. And I really wish you all many, many blessings. Thank you so much. Uh-oh, just as I start the video, it starts raining. I hope the rain doesn't mess this up. <clears throat> Don't know what the sound is going to be like, but this is an old love song by the Moody Blues. And so uh, thinking of love, I thought it just might be appropriate for today. My boat sails stormy seas. Battles, oceans fill the tears. At last, my poet's in view. And now that I discovered you, oh, I give my life so lightly.
I love you so to drown. 